showing so many um, opera golf images out there, and I'm sure there's so many that we haven't seen yet, but do you have one that you just resonates with you so much that you really love looking back on? Oh, gosh. Yeah. All the world showcase things he did, particularly the illustration of how the architecture would work one next to another, because that was a very hard thing to convince our own Disney management that those things could relate to one another, you know, putting Japan next to Italy or something like that. And uh, so the fact that Harper could illustrate that and show how uh, easily and compatible it was really made it possible for us to, to convince everybody that it would work. And also then to go out to the different countries and say, here's how this is going to work. Yeah. In your presentation, you talked about uh, some of the countries that, that were inspirational behind the uh, various scenes throughout the adventure lands. Are, are there some that are more prominent in some of the uh, domestic parks or the other parks than others? I mean, does, do some countries, uh, adventure lands, take more influence from one place than another? Not, not uh, by this time. I think it's kind of a smorgasbord of different places in the world and, and uh, different landscapes from different parts of the world. Um, the wonderful thing about Bill Evans is he knew all those plants, where they came from. He traveled to many of those places. And one thing I didn't include was uh, uh, on occasion he brought back some seeds in his pockets. And uh, of course you can't do that. But travel was different in those days. It was, right. And, and uh, so um, it gave an authenticity to uh, the whole jungle cruise. And in different parts of the world, I mean, building uh, a jungle cruise here is in many ways easier than in California. And in Hong Kong, the biggest problem we have in jungle cruise is it, the jungle taking over. <laughs> <laughs> and then the weather and the amount of rain and everything and it really is a, a, a quite an issue because we have to keep it so that the guests can see things but at the same time you want that whole feeling of being in the jungle there was mention of Iran once being planned for Epcot World Showcase are there other countries that you felt were a loss that, that didn't ever quite make it into World Showcase but that had been talked about? Oh gosh. We pitched, you know, one of the problems uh, with uh, doing an international project is that all those countries are, are uh, members of the Bureau of International Expositions and their rules are you can only be in a, a uh, expo or a fair for one year. And so when, when it comes to something like Morocco, the king said, I'm not going about that. You know? Yes. We're going to be in this project, but most of the other countries are uh, really companies in those countries that are representing the country. For that reason. Now, with uh, with like Adventureland, you've seen so many concept arts for all the different attractions, like Tiki Room and, and Jungle Cruise. How long from concept to reality did that take, especially for the original Disneyland? Uh, it was probably, the, Disneyland they used to say it was a year and a day from the start of construction at Disneyland to, to opening. And so that meant that, for example, for the Jungle Cruise, the, the huge trees that Bill Evans was able to get because they were building the Santa Ana Freeway or, or Pershing Square in downtown Los Angeles where they would call Bill and say, Bill, we've got these great specimen trees. You can have it if you can get here tomorrow and take it out. Otherwise, we're cutting it down. And uh, he, he had enough contact, so uh, he uh, was able to get great specimen 
sort of play the parts. But, you know, different attractions take different amounts of time. Typically, though, a, a, a really big attraction takes about four years to do from the beginning to end. Uh, but in, in the case of uh, the Tiki Room, there was much less than that. And the, the, the fastest ever was, uh, it, it's a small world for the World's Fair, which UNICEF contacted Europe and made the deal 11 months before the fair opened. And that whole attraction was done in 11 months. You talked about the simpler nature of the early technology used to move the animals on the original jungle cruise. What, what direction have you seen that move in over the years in terms of using technology in Adventureland where you try to blend in more with nature and look less like you're using technology? When I go back and talk to the Imagineers, which I do from time to time, I always say I'm really jealous because the storytelling you're doing now, you have amazing tools to use that we never had before. And uh, it's wonderful to uh, be, be able to have all that technology to, to use wherever you use it. And, you know, we try to keep the technology behind the scenes because it, unless it's directly part of the story. If it's part of the story, then you want people to see it. But for the most part, you um, want it hidden and the, the so-called the, the magic to be able to, how did they do that? You know? And that's part of the business, I think. Are you the Imagineers at this point in your career? Are you in retirement? Not all. But um, I think some of the things they did, for example, Pirates of the Caribbean and Shanghai is extraordinary. You know, what the boat can do, the boat can move and basically in any direction you want to. And the seamless blend between big sets and, and film is quite extraordinary today. Things you can do digitally that you can never do before uh, in an attraction uh, are possible today because of digital technology. Mm -hmm. What do you think it is about the Jungle Cruise that, that makes it just still so popular today with, with guests? Well, you're, you're really going into an environment that uh, that's a, a good part of the story, and the environment is convincing, very convincing. You're, you're in a jungle, right? And then you add the humor on top of it from, from the uh, operators, and uh, that gives it uh, a lot of story and fun, and, and uh, people will play off, you know, and you know, that, that, you know, it's all about uh, the guest experience and uh, when you can put people in, in an environment that's so authentic, that is really a great opportunity. There's so much emphasis these days on computer-generated technology and uh, simulation, as opposed to um, the years past where there was a lot of dark rides, audio animatronics, and so on and so forth. Um, do you feel like that the attractions of the past could benefit from being updated with newer technology, such as um, simulation, or do you prefer to keep them in their um, classic... Well, everything depends upon the story you're trying to tell. And sometimes you can tell a story very simply. Uh, I, I mentioned doing the It's a Small World in 11 months. There was basically a rule that you couldn't do anything you had to invent new, te new technology because there wasn't time. So everything had to be something you could buy off the shelf, basically, in order to make those characters work. But now we make sure that we have enough time so we can figure out the best possible way to do something. And that's really the key. Because there's, there's no one way to do uh, any of these things. Uh, figuring out how to do the most often a complicated idea, make it simple. Uh, whatever the story is, how do we communicate that to the public? 
uh, can be very simple things. I was on the, uh, the, the Norway ride yesterday, this week, and those characters, are, the animation is really terrific. Uh, and uh, it's very simple stuff. You were showing video of uh, other folks taking the wheel of the uh, jungle cruise. Have you ever done it yourself? I don't know that I've seen a picture of it. No. No. Uh, uh, I don't think I'd be a very good operator. <laughs> I did. Uh, I used to, at Disneyland Christmas parties, I used to drive the, uh, uh, one of the vehicles, often the, the uh, double-deck bus. And it was, it was very interesting to me because people don't think they can get hurt in Hanover. And here's this big bus coming very slowly down the street. And they don't move. People don't move. And, and it, was, it was very difficult. Very difficult. I had a new appreciation for the, for the operators. Is that something that has remained constant throughout the history of the parks that you've experienced, or has it changed over the years where folks have gotten even less careful around the buses, for example? No, I just don't think they think they. And, and fortunately, our record is such. That there's no issue here, but I don't think they think about. They think they're very safe, in the and they are. And safety is always the first concern. Uh, and and uh, I think, in many ways, Disney's paranoid about that in a good way, because. Uh, that's the worst thing that can happen to the family. One of the things I always talk to uh, the operators about too was they always have to remember that that for the guests, that family, it may be the only time they ever come to one of these parks. And making that experience as wonderful for them as possible is so important you have to think about that that they may not come they may not be able to come back they may be from Australia or Japan or something wherever uh, and I think I always said the operators are we do wonderful designs wonderful stories from imaginary but the operators are on the front lines a lot of time and they can make or break an experience. And the Jungle Cruise operators probably, uh, you'd probably say that's one of the most important from that standpoint. <laughs>